Welcome to our review on making fertilizers. One thing that you do need to be able to do is to explain how to carry out an experiment in the school lab to make a fertilizer. And the key principle here is that we are going to make a fertilizer by neutralizing an acid with an alkali to make the neutral salt, which is our fertilizer. And hopefully this is giving you a bit of a reminder about something we talked about in C5, which is that good old titration process. One thing that we should be aware of is how to actually name the salts that we make in this neutralization reaction. So hopefully you do remember some of your earlier chemistry knowledge that the first thing you look at in our alkali is the name of the metal. And that goes in first and that bits in green, as you can see in the middle there. And then we look at the acid and the acid gives you the ending for the salt. So that if it's sulfuric acid, we make a sulfate. So it makes potassium sulfate. I've given you the four common acids you need to remember and the type of salt that they will make. So hydrochloric makes a chloride, sulfuric is a sulfate, nitric makes nitrate and phosphoric acid makes a phosphate. So make sure you remember those four because one of their favorite questions is asking you the name of the fertilizer that's made or they ask you to give the name of the acid and the alkali it's made from. So as long as you can remember those endings, you can always identify the acid and then whatever the name in front is, if it was potassium, sodium, whatever it is, general word is stick hydroxide at the end and you'll have an alkali. So that should get you the marks on that every time. A quick recap on how we carry out our titration then. We fill the burette with acid, which is the long glass tube in our clamp stand. We then use a volumetric pipette to transfer 25 centimeters cubed of our alkali to the conical flask. We add a few drops of our single indicator. We then record the start volume and we add the acid while swirling the flask constantly until the indicator has that distinctive color change, which signifies the end point. You then record the end volume and you'll repeat that procedure until you obtain concordant readings, which are the ones that are within 0.1 centimeters cubed of each other. Just as a reminder about those single indicators that we do tend to use, we use litmus, phenolphthalein, and methyl orange. So litmus is red in acidic solution, blue in an alkaline solution, phenolphthalein, colorless in acidic, and pink in alkaline, and methyl orange, red in acidic, yellow in alkaline. So they have that very distinctive end point and there's no mixing up of what color it could be as we'd see with something like universal indicator. So once we've actually carried out our titration and got to our end point, then we add activated charcoal to our solution. And the whole idea behind that is that it's gonna attract the phenolphthalein. We can then filter the solution and that will just leave us with our actual salt in solution. When we evaporate the solution off, we just have our fertilizer crystals left. When we're talking about making chemicals in industry, we basically have a choice between two processes to do this. We could either make them through something called a batch process, or we could make them through something called a continuous process. When we're considering things like fertilizers, they're an example of a bulk chemical. It's something we need in large amounts. So in order to make these bulk chemicals, the ones we need large quantities of, we use continuous process. Whereas if we only needed smaller quantities of a chemical, particularly things like our pharmaceuticals, which are speciality chemicals, then we make them through batch process. One thing that you do need to be able to do is to select whether we'd make something through either batch or continuous process and justify why. So this table here summarizes those key features about both batch and continuous process for you. So the rate of production is basically how quickly we can make those chemicals. In batch process, it's actually quite low, whereas in continuous process, the rate of production is high. If we then consider the cost of the equipment, so all the machinery, etc., in order to carry out the process, batch process is low, continuous process is high. 
the number of workers needed because it's not just a case of having the equipment and it all does it itself we do need some people to work there and if we're considering batch process we actually need quite a few people to work there so we have a large number of workers which means high wage costs whereas in continuous process it's actually a smaller number of workers so the wage costs are lower the shutdown periods are the times when the equipment is actually turned off for whatever reason in batch process that happens frequently because they have to turn it off clear it out change over all the chemicals etc to make a different chemical whereas in continuous process this is pretty much a 24 7 process so the shutdown periods are very rare and then the last one on there the ease of automating the process this just looks at how easy is it for us to use a computer to run the actual process batch process is very low in its ease whereas continuous process is actually very easy to automate so a large proportion of it is run by computers and sensors hence why we have a much smaller workforce required hopefully at the end of this video you can describe how to make a fertilizer in the lab and you can also compare the different methods of producing chemicals as either batch or continuous giving reasons for why the costs involved may be different